If you're listening to my lectures in the order that I'm doing them, then this will be the last acute pain lecture. This lecture is on opioid pharmacology, so we'll cover basic principles, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, definitely touch on the side effects and adverse effects from opioids, and then we'll end uh, with talking about specific opioids and what is relevant to them. HIPAA and disclosures are as follows. The information contained herein has been compiled as part of UK Healthcare's Patient Safety Evaluation Systems, is deemed to be patient safety work product, and is privileged and confidential. I have no financial disclosures to report. The following are the learning objectives for this lecture. We will review opioid principles discuss pharmacokinetics of opioids, discuss pharmacodynamics of opioids, review the side effects and adverse effects, and then we'll describe specific opioids in detail. When individuals talk about opioids, they typically will use the terms opioid, opiate, and narcotic. When they do so, they typically use these terms in an interchangeable way However, each of these have their own meanings. An opiate refers to compounds, typically your natural alkaloids, that are derived from the opium poppy. Morphine is the prototype of this. Your other opiates also include codeine and opium itself. As a side note, morphine was originally called morphium after the Greek god Morpheus, which is the Greek god of dreams. Opioids are your semi-synthetic or your synthetic modifications of morphine. So if it's synthetic, the easiest way to think of this is it's completely made in the lab by chemicals. If it's semi-synthetic, it's still made in the lab but it's derived or using part of those natural alkaloids such as morphine to make the new substance. Overall, these are substances that act on the opioid receptors to produce morphine-like effects. There are some opioid principles worth reviewing. For instance, opioids will reduce the MAC of volatile anesthetics. Opioids are relatively hemodynamically stable when used alone, but can cause changes in cardiac output, stroke volume, and blood pressure when used with other anesthetics. They are known to increase the apneic threshold and decrease the hypoxic drive. When used in large doses, they will cause unconsciousness, but do not reliably produce amnesia. They generally reduce cerebral blood flow, cerebral oxygen consumption, ICP, but will have minimal effects on the EEG. And then, of course, they have a synergistic effect with other CNS depressants. The clinical uses for opioids is not a long list by any means, but the uses that the opioids do have are majorly important. The most common and the one that we deal with on a daily basis is analgesia. This can range anywhere from mild pain to severe pain and from acute pain to chronic pain. Opioids will also produce sedation. We'll most commonly see this during our MAC cases where we give opioids to help sedate the patient so that they can tolerate the procedure. And then opioids can also be used for anesthesia. You typically need high doses and they are typically used as adjuncts. Remember, opioids can produce unconsciousness, but do not reliably produce amnesia. And then some less common uses include cough suppression, such as with codeine, and antidiarrheal. Now we'll get into the pharmacodynamics of the opioids. This exact pharmacodynamics of a specific opioid is dependent on which receptors are bound the binding affinity, and if activation occurs. In general, the mechanism of action of an opioid is as an agonist.
An opioid will bind to an opioid receptor coupled to G proteins that will then inhibit adenyl cyclase. This then inhibits voltage-gated calcium channels, but activates and opens potassium channels. This leads to intracellular potassium increasing, which then decreases neurotransmission. The three major receptors for opioids are your mu, kappa, and delta receptors. The main opioid receptors are the mu, kappa, and delta receptors. Each of these type of receptors have their own subtypes, but only the mu subtypes will we differentiate between. The mu receptors are the primary receptors responsible for analgesia and adverse effects that we worry about. Mu1 is responsible for analgesia, whereas Mu2 receptor is responsible for more of the adverse effects like respiratory depression, bradycardia, and dependence. Your kappa receptor inhibits neurotransmission via type N calcium channels. These receptors are responsible for dysphoria and diuresis. Your delta receptors modulate the mu receptor activity and is the receptor for endogenous opioids such as your endorphins. This is a chart showing where each type of opioid receptor is located and some of their responsibilities. In general though, each type of the opioid receptors are located both supraspinal and spinal. There are also receptors found in the periphery. If a receptor is supraspinal, it's typically located in the periaqueductal gray matter. If it's at the spinal level, it's in the substantia gelatinosa. You can review the chart to see what the mu and kappa receptors are both responsible for as far as effects and side effects. Now let's move on to the pharmacokinetics of opioids. Pharmacokinetics involves the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So we'll start with absorption. The common absorption methods are intravenous and PO or gastrointestinal absorption. But you can also have oral transmucosal absorption, such as with a fentanyl lollipop, this type of absorption results in a rapid onset of sedation and analgesia. You can have intramuscular absorption of opioids. This will result in rapid and complete absorption with morphine. And peak levels typically are achieved in 20 to 60 minutes. And then transdermal absorption. Again, fentanyl is a common example of this. And fentanyl is used for transdermal because of its high lipid solubility and low molecular weight. Next is the distribution of opioids. Distribution contributes to the onset and duration of action. Each onset and duration of action of an opioid depends on its ionization and lipid solubility. For example, a non-ionized and lipophilic opioid will have a rapid onset but a short duration of action. The distribution also involves the fusion across the blood-brain barrier and opioids commonly redistribute to inactive tissues like skeletal muscle or fat. At small doses this will terminate the opioid action. High doses of lipid soluble opioids will tend to saturate the inactive tissues and thus accumulate in the plasma. This results in a longer duration of action. The first pass uptake for specific opioids is a little unique. Your lipid soluble opioids can undergo first pass uptake by the lungs. They can later then diffuse back into systemic circulation. The amount of uptake by the lungs can depend on three things prior accumulation of another drug, which will decrease the uptake, history of tobacco use, which will increase the uptake, and then current volatile anesthetic administration, which will decrease the uptake.
This figure shows the opioid peak effect times with minutes since bolus injection on the x-axis and then the percent of peak effect site concentration on the y-axis. This focuses on the effect site because remember your opioid receptors are not located in the plasma. Overall this is a generalization of the opioid onset times. Remember that the onset and duration of action of an opioid is dependent on the lipid solubility and ionization of, the, of that specific opioid. So if you look at this figure, you can conclude that remifentanil, alfentanil, fentanyl, sufentanil are commonly your more lipid soluble and ionized opioids, which as the graph depicts, shows a quicker onset time. Remifentanil and alfentanil will have an onset time of about one and a half minutes. Fentanyl is closer to three to five, and then you is a little bit longer than that. If you look at your other opioids that are not lipid soluble, like morphine and Dilaudid, which we commonly use, the peak effect time for morphine is anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes. You can see the slow up curve still of the morphine line. So it will take a while to get to that peak effect. Clinically, this may come into play when you order your PACU meds. A lot of providers will order fentanyl Q5, Q10 minutes going on this pharmacology. Whereas if they order Dilaudid or morphine, they'll usually do Q20, Q15, maybe even Q30 minutes, giving it time to reach that onset rather than stacking doses on top of each other. This figure shows the increase in effect site concentration during a continuous infusion for each of the opioids. As expected, remifentanil is the fastest and methadone is the slowest. Sufentanil, as you can see, is kind of in between the two. Um, it's quicker than your common opioids like morphine, Dilaudid, and fentanyl, but not nearly quite as fast as remifentanil but still an effective opioid to use in a, as an infusion in the OR. Another thing to take from this figure is that even after 10 hours of drug administration, most of these opioids only reach a 60 to 80 percent steady state concentration. This is clinically relevant when considering infusions for a PCA. If you hook the patient up to an infusion of an opioid through a PCA, it will take hours and hours and hours to reach a steady state. So it may never reach that steady state, but yet you're exposing the patient to toxic levels of the opioids. Thus, PCA infusions, continuous infusions with uh, opioids is not recommended or ideal. To finish the pharmacokinetics of opioids, will end with the metabolism and excretion of opioids. Metabolism is by the liver and specifically by the cytochrome P453A4 enzyme. Excretion is renally. Now this is a very broad generalization for the opioids because remifentanil, for example, is metabolized by plasma esterases. A very important principle to discuss when talking about opioids is the context-sensitive half-life. The definition of context-sensitive half-life is the time required for the plasma drug concentration to decline by 50% after termination of an infusion. Essentially, it's the plasma pharmacokinetic portion of the offset time. Not to get too complicated, this is talking about the plasma concentrations and not the actual effect site concentrations which has totally different curves and an offset time. This figure shows the context-sensitive half-life of opioid infusions. Infusion duration is on the x-axis and the minutes to 50% decrement in plasma concentration is the y-axis. One of the biggest takeaways from this figure is that of remifentanil. Its context-sensitive half-life is about 3-5 minutes regardless of how long the infusion is going. So whether the infusion runs for an hour or 10 hours, 
its contact sensitive half life stays at three minutes. In general, for the other opioids, typically the longer the duration of the infusion, the higher the contact sensitive half life. For example, let's look at sufentanil. If you have a sufentanil infusion that lasts 60 minutes, your contact sensitive half life is probably going to be around 10 15 minutes uh, based on this figure. But if you run it for six hours or greater, now you're looking at a context of half-life of 30 or more minutes. This is why if we run infusions of remifentanil, we can run it till the very end of a case and then turn it off. But for sufentanil, you need to consider how long that infusion has been going and then turn it off typically 30 to 45 minutes before the end of the case. One of the outliers for this is fentanyl. You can see it has a very steep curve. Once you get past about 60 to 120 minutes, the upslope is significant. So its contact sensitive half-life becomes very significant uh, the longer the duration goes. And this is because fentanyl will accumulate in the fat tissues, resulting in a storage of fentanyl. There are a few opioids that have metabolites that we need to be cautious and know about. It's these metabolites from these few opioids that will accumulate in patients with renal failure or renal insufficiency. Morphine is the first one. If you give a patient morphine, it gets converted to morphine 3-glucuronide and morphine 6-glucuronide, or M6G. It's the M6G that is an extremely potent and longer lasting opioid derivative and it can cause severe respiratory depression. So if this accumulates in a patient, you're going to get severe respiratory depression in them. The other one that we worry about is mepiridine and its metabolite normepiridine. Normepiridine is a potent analgesic but it has CNS excitatory effects and if accumulates in these patients can result in things like anxiety, tremor, and probably most worrisome, seizures. Opioids provide great analgesia but in doing so there are also adverse and side effects that we need to worry about. Typically your opioids have a well-known side effect profile some of these side effects include things like sedation, respiratory depression, chest wall rigidity, especially at high doses on induction. As far as cardiovascular, you can get bradycardia and hypotension. The exception to bradycardia is mepiridine, and that's because it has an atropine-like component to it. And then some other side effects include puritis, which is a very common complaint, nausea and vomiting, another common complaint, ileus, urinary retention, and then you can also get meiosis, not something that's usually worrisome for the patient, but it is a side effect from an opioid, and this is useful to assess patients when under general anesthesia. Opioids will also decrease fetal heart rate in parturients, and some opioids like morphine will cause a histamine release. This will result in puritis, vasodilation, and hypotension. And again, morphine is the most common one for histamine release. This is a picture diagram of all the various opioid side effects. And as you can see, there are quite a few. This is organized into your organ-based systems. Of note, there are two of these side effects that rarely, if ever, develop a tolerance, and that is constipation and meiosis. As far as the other side effects that are listed, I'm not going to go through them because the side effect profile, as I mentioned before, is well known. Before we get to the specific opioids, there's a few more opioid principles that we'll discuss over the next few slides. The first is the immune effects from opioids. So opioids are known to depress cellular immunity and more specifically inhibit interleukin-2 transcription. Opioids can also impair wound healing and can also play a part in perioperative infections. And then it's also thought that opioids can play a part in cancer recurrence 
And it's this and the inhibit, inhibition of interleukin-2 transcription that is starting to show up more and more in the literature. If you have a patient on an MAOI such as phenylzine or isocarboxazid, you need to use caution when using certain opioids. Your MAOIs are responsible for the metabolism of endogenous monoamines like serotonin. If you give an MAOI, it will inhibit this metabolism, leading to an increase in uh, serotonin. And then some opioids are weak serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So if you give that in addition, even more serotonin will accumulate, ultimately poss and possibly causing serotonin toxicity, also known as serotonin syndrome. Some of these opioids you use caution are mepiridine, methadone, tramadol, and fentanyl. If they do develop serotonin toxicity, what you'll typically see is fever, diaphoresis, shivering, myoclonus, CNS uh, effects like agitation, confusion, and eventually, if severe enough, you'll get things like respiratory depression, coma, and death. Some opioid medications will have a partial agonist and partial antagonist property to them. These medications will typically have opposite actions at different receptors. They will have an analgesic effect when used alone, but with a sealing effect. So basically at higher doses, it will not produce a desired effect or side effects. So as you slowly increase a certain medication, your respiratory depression will worsen until a certain peak is reached. After that you can give as much medicine as you want but that respiratory depression will not get any worse. In addition when combined with a full agonist these meds will act as an antagonist. For instance now bufine will help relieve pruritus caused by neuroaxial opioids because with the neuroaxial opioids it is now acting as purely as an antagonist. Some examples of these meds include now bufine and butorphanol, which are both a partial agonist and partial antagonist. And then buprenorphine is typically considered this because it's combined with naloxone, which is an antagonist, and buprenorphine is a partial agonist. As good as opioids are for analgesia, they can also lead to unwanted situations such as overdoses. Fortunately, though, we have opioid reversal medications like naloxone and naltrexone. Naloxone binds to opioid receptors without activating them. Its duration of action is 30 to 60 minutes, so it may need to be repeated or an infusion started depending on which opioid has led to the overdose and is being antagonized. Some side effects of naloxone include the reversal of analgesia, nausea and vomiting, cardiovascular effects like tachycardia, hypertension, and dysrhythmias, and then you can even get flash pulmonary edema from naloxone. Naloxone is typically given IV, but it can also be given as a nasal spray or subcutaneous or intramuscular. Naltrexone is given PO. Its onset is slower, but has a longer duration of action. This equianalgesic opioid dosing chart is used for opioid conversion, either from an IV form to an oral, or from one opioid to another opioid. The written test could very easily ask you to convert from one opioid to the other, and unfortunately I don't have any easy way to remember the equal analgesics from say morphine to hydrocodone or Dilaudid. So you'll have to just take the time and kind of remember the more common opioids. Now this chart is also a very simplistic uh, conversion ratio chart. Typically your conversions have many more factors involved such as chronicity of opioid use, uh, total daily doses, even things like ethnicity and age. And then converting from IV to oral and oral to IV isn't even that simplistic. Now that you've seen the opioid conversion chart or you have the chart in front of you, you should be asking yourself 
how do I convert from one opioid to another? So on the slide, I provided you one method of doing the conversion, but keep in mind this is not the only method and may not be the easiest. But let's walk through it. So you have a patient on a medicine. You want to calculate the 24-hour opioid dose of that opioid for that patient. Then, using the equal analgesic table, select the new opioid. Next, you want to solve that conversion for the new dose and then divide this new 24-hour dose by the number of doses per day. Last, you want to decrease that by about 25 to 50 percent to account for cross tolerance. And then once the patient's on it, you can titrate to clinical effect. So I've provided an example. Say you have a patient that's on morphine at 15 milligrams Q4 hours. So that would equal 90 milligrams over a 24-hour period. Next, you wanted to convert it to Dilaudid. And Dilaudid conversion is 7.5 milligrams is equal to 30 milligrams of morphine. Your equation becomes 90 milligrams divided by 30 milligrams is equal to X over 7.5 milligrams, which then equals 22.5 milligrams. You'll take this 22.5 milligrams and divide it by 4 doses to come up with 5.7 milligrams Q6 hours. And then with your reduction, you can give this patient now 4 milligrams of Dilaudid Q6 hours. Another opioid conversion principle to know is when going from intrathecal to epidural to IV to PO for the same opioid. So for instance, with morphine, when going from intrathecal to epidural, and this is a generalization again, you'll typically multiply it by 10, and then going from epidural to IV, you multiply by 10, and then when going from IV to PO, you multiply by 3. So 1 milligram intrathecal dose of morphine, if you want to give that epidurally, you would give 10 milligrams. If you want to give that IV, then you would give 100 milligrams. And instead of IV and you want to give PO, you would divide, or multiply that dose by 3, making it 300 milligrams. So 1 milligram of intrathecal morphine would be equivalent to 300 milligrams of PO morphine. This chart compares the IV opioids and some of the more important characteristics of each that we will consider when choosing what IV opioid to give to our patients. Two of the most important characteristics is the peak onset, so how long does it take for it to work if I give it to my patient, and then the duration of action, how long is it going to last when I give it to my patient. The last column also includes infusions, so a few of these will tell you that you can do it in the ICU, a few say that it's a common practice to use in the OR, and there's a few that you don't use at all typically for an infusion. Your first column is your analgesic equivalent. So it's looking at all of these IV opioids and giving you an equivalent dose to each other. The way I look at this is I use fentanyl as my, I guess my foundation, my base. Since I give that every day, I have a better understanding. So if I gave 50 mics of fentanyl, but then I wanted to give sufenta, I would give five mics. So that five mics of sufenta is equal to 50 mics of fentanyl. Again, this is easier to me than to say using mepiridine or methadone as my comparison base. A couple other things to notice in the analgesic equivalent column is the mepiridine equivalent. It's 37 and a half milligrams. So you can see that this is kind of a weak opioid uh, based on the analgesic equivalent. The other thing to look at is the morphine and Dilaudid. One of the things I ask in the OR when you give Dilaudid is, do you know how much morphine that's equivalent to? Again, morphine gives us a little bit better understanding, at least for most of us. So that's why I asked this. So if you give somebody, um, say, a milligram or mil let's say a milligram and a half of Dilaudid, I'll ask you, how much morphine is that? Well, if you look on here on this uh, chart, you'll see that a milligram and a half of Dilaudid would be equal to 10 milligrams of morphine. So when you give 0.2 milligrams of Dilaudid, that's another time I'll ask you, do you know how much morphine that is? Well, you can do the conversion based on this chart. For the peak onset, you can see that alfentanil 
have the really quick onset time, but so does Remy Fentanyl and Sue Fentanyl, um, as well as Fentanyl. So all the Fentanyl or Fentanyl-like name medications typically have the quickest onset time. Morphine's a little bit longer at 10 to 20 minutes, which we discussed before. So when you give your orders and you order fentanyl, you'll typically repeat the dose in 5 to 10 minutes. And with morphine, it's usually 15, 20, 15, 30 minutes that you'll repeat the dose. The duration of action, again, the ones that have the quickest onset typically have the shortest duration of action. The ones with the lo longer onset time typically have a longer duration of action. As far as infusions, your common OR infusions are your Remy Fentanyl, Su Fentanyl. The common ICU infusions are Dilaudid and Morphine. And Fentanyl can be used uh, as well in the ICU. Here it mention, mentions with caution, but uh, at the facility that we are at, Fentanyl is a common ICU infusion. This is a similar comparison chart, but for PO opioids. Again, it includes peak onset times, duration of action times, but now it includes elimination column as well as a potency relative to IV morphine column. As you would expect with PO opioids, the onset time is longer as well as the duration of action compared to your IV opioids. The elimination is hepatic for all of these uh, PO opioids. And then as far as the potency, you can see that codeine is another weak opioid compared to morphine, whereas your oxycodone and hydrocodone are pretty equivalent. And then your methadone is a stronger opioid compared to morphine. We'll finish by talking about individual opioids and key characteristics that pertain to them. So we'll start with morphine. Morphine has a slower peak time, but a longer duration of action. And this duration of action is even longer in patients with renal failure. Again, M6G metabolite will accumulate in patients with renal failure or insufficiency. And morphine is a big player in causing histamine release. Mepiridine, also called Demerol, was originally discovered as a local anesthetic. It's a weak analgesic and is most commonly used to treat shivering in the post-op period. Along with its local anesthetic type structure, it also has an atropine-like structure, thus giving it anticholinergic properties. In your renal failure, renal insufficiency patients, normipiridine, the Mepiridine's metabolite can accumulate and cause seizures. You want to avoid mepiridine in patients taking MAOIs. Just like morphine, mepiridine can also cause a histamine release. And it will cause a euphoric effect with less respiratory depression. Hydromorphone is also called Dilaudid. It has a longer duration of action. And you'll want to titrate this opioid slower because its peak effect can take 15 minutes. Just like morphine and mepiridine, hydromorphone also has a metabolite, but we tend to worry about it a little less. Its metabolite is called hydromorphone 3 glucuronide. This metabolite has no analgesic properties, but can cause neuroexcitation. And it has no histamine release. Fentanyl, when compared to the opioids just discussed, has a more rapid onset. However, it has a shorter duration of action. This shorter duration of action can be beneficial in decreasing the occurrence of emergence, delirium, and even PONV. The duration of action can also be prolonged with frequent repeated boluses of fentanyl. It's typically easier to titrate compared to other opioids and is commonly used at induction to blunt the sympathetic response during laryngoscopy. If you remember from the previous graphs that I showed you, it has a very long context sensitive half-life, so it's not ideal to use as an infusion in the OR. I added a slide on the fentanyl patch because it's starting to be tested on.
but fentanyl patch works by transdermal absorption. With this, peak plasma concentrations usually develop in 14 to 24 hours. It takes quite some time to develop this because a reservoir in the dermis needs to be developed first. And this can occur later in the elderly. So peak plasma concentrations are on the long end of the spectrum, if not longer. The amount of fentanyl released depends on several things. One is the patch surface area. The more surface area, the more fentanyl that will be released. And then other things like local skin conditions, increased blood flow versus decreased blood flow, as well as increased temperature versus decreased temperature. And last, a fentanyl patch can lead to an increased incidence of nausea and vomiting. Remy fentanyl is most commonly used as an infusion. It can provide great analgesia intraop, but essentially none post-op. It's also useful to prevent movement when a neuromuscular blocker is not used. It has a very, very short context sensitive half-life, and sometimes you'll see it stated as context insensitive half-life. And this is because it's rapidly metabolized by plasma esterases. It can cause bradycardia, which is quite common, and you may need to use atropine or glycopyrrolate to offset this. You can develop acute opioid tolerance from sudden cessation of a remifentanil infusion, as well as opioid-induced hyperalgesia, typically from long, high-dose infusions. Sufentanil is another IV opioid that's commonly used as an infusion, but it can be used as bolus dosing. If used as an infusion compared to remifentanil, it will provide analgesia interop and post-op. Its contact sensitive half-life is more desirable than that of fentanyl and you'll want to turn it off about 30 minutes prior to the end of surgery. Alfentanil is most commonly used as a bolus, particularly for short periods of intense pain, for example a DL by an ENT surgeon. It has the fastest onset time and that's due to its high non-ionized fraction and small volume of distribution. It also will rapidly cross the blood-brain barrier. It has a brief duration of action due to redistribution, and it's an opioid that is more likely to cause nausea and vomiting, chest wall rigidity, and respiratory depression. And unique to alfentanil, if a patient is on a seven-day course of erythromycin, this can impair biotransformation. Methadone is the opioid with the longest half-life of about 24 hours. It takes time to reach a steady state and may accumulate in this time. It's a racemic mixture of L-methadone and D-methadone. The L-methadone is the opioid agonist and the D-methadone is the NMDA antagonist. Be cautious with the use of methadone because it can cause QT prolongation, so you'll want to get a pre-EKG before starting it, as well as a post-EKG, typically about 24 hours after starting it. We'll finish with a slide on cytochrome P450 2D6. This is a hepatic enzyme that is responsible for metabolizing codeine, tramadol, oxycodone, and hydrocodone. Codeine is metabolized to morphine. 10% of Caucasians lack this enzyme. So if you don't convert codeine to morphine, you'll have no analgesia. On the other hand, there are individuals that we refer to as rapid metabolizers. And they rapidly metabolize codeine to morphine. In doing so, this produces analgesia, but it can also lead to toxicity. Tramadol is metabolized to O-desmethyl tramadol, and this is a more potent analgesic than tramadol itself. This concludes our opioid pharmacology lecture. Thank you for listening.